country needs every ounce of its energy to restore itself. The costs of government are all assessed upon the people. This means that the farmer is doomed to provide a certain amount of money out of the sale of his produce, no matter how low the price to pay his taxes. The manufacturer, the professional man, the clerk must do the same from their income. We must be armed so that no foreign nation will even entertain the dangerous thought of starting over these 3,000 miles of ocean towards us. Today, many of our citizens consciously or unconsciously are considering peace or war with the totalitarian government. And the most vital realism in all our relations with the world today requires that we keep out of these wars unless the Western Hemisphere is attacked. Never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Frankly and definitely, there is danger ahead. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger or the fear of it by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. If Great Britain goes down, the Axis powers will control the continents of Europe and Asia and Africa and Australasia and the high seas. And they will be in a position to bring enormous military and naval resources against this hemisphere. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. With the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. To do that, we are now engaged in a process of deploying millions of our armed forces against Japan in a mass movement of troops and supplies and weapons over 14,000 miles, a military and naval feat unequaled in all history. I believe, first, the preservation of free America requires our participation in the defense of Western Europe. Second, success is attainable. Given unity and spirit and action, the job can be done. Third, while the transfer to Europe of American military units is essential, our major and special contribution should be in the field of munitions and equipment. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue. It is wrong deadly wrong to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Good evening. Last January 15th, I went before your senators and representatives in Congress with a comprehensive plan to make our country independent of foreign sources of energy by 1985. Such a program was long overdue. 
We have become increasingly at the mercy of others for the fuel on which our entire economy runs. I've just been talking about forces of potential destruction that mankind has developed and how we might control them. It's equally important that we remember the beneficial forces that we have evolved over the ages and how to hold fast to them. One of those constructive forces is the enhancement of individual human freedoms through the strengthening of democracy and the fight against deprivation, torture, terrorism, and the persecution of people throughout the world. The struggle for human rights overrides all differences of color or nation or language. We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together that the advance of human liberty the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace there is one sign the soviets can make that would be unmistakable that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace general secretary gorbachev if you seek peace if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. My opponent now says he'll raise them as a last resort or a third resort. But when a politician talks like that, you know that's one resort he'll be checking into. And I... My opponent... My opponent won't rule out raising taxes, but I will and the Congress will push me to raise taxes and I'll say no. And they'll push and I'll say no. And they'll push again and I'll say... To them, read my lips. No new taxes. Now, I have to go back to work on my State of the Union speech. And I worked on it till pretty late last night. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, Coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, 221 years ago, in a hall that still stands across the street, a group of men gathered and, with these simple words, launched America's improbable experiment in democracy. Farmers and scholars, statesmen and patriots who had traveled across the ocean to escape tyranny and persecution, finally made real their declaration of independence at a Philadelphia convention that lasted through the spring of 1787. The document they produced was eventually signed, but ultimately unfinished. It was stained by this nation's original sin of slavery, a question that divided the colonies and brought the convention to a stalemate until the founders chose to allow the slave trade to continue for at least 20 more years and to leave any final resolution to future generations. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. And, 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 and if you reported it accurately, 
you would say? They were in Charlottesville. They, start, they showed up in Charlottesville Excuse me. to protest. Excuse the me. They didn't put themselves down as you. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group. Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Folks, the people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we the people. We've won with the most votes ever cast on presidential ticket in the history of the nation, 74 million. What I must admit has surprised me. Tonight, we're seeing all over this nation, all cities and all parts of the country, indeed across the world, an outpouring of joy, of hope, renewed faith, and tomorrow, bring a better day. And I'm humbled by the trust and confidence you placed in me. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify, who, who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States.